Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and preach in their cities. Now John had heard in the prison the works of Christ. He sent two of his disciples, and he said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto him, Go and show John again those things which you do see and hear. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now I'm going to get spunky. You don't have to turn there, but if she would put Luke chapter 3, verse 20 up. I want you to see this the remainder of the service because I want this to get in your heart tonight. I want this to get in your soul tonight. And I believe this is an on-time word for some people tonight. Added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. Look at the last part of that. He shut up John in prison. He shut up John in prison. I want to preach a little while tonight from the subject of lockdown. Because so many times when we come to church, I realize I'm preaching to people who have a promise on lockdown. You, you believe in God for stuff, but you feel like, I've got a little bit of feedback. If y'all, I don't know, it's probably my microphone. It's a little beat up. But uh, if I'm, am I, am I lisping a little bit? Is it okay? Does it sound okay up there? All right. So many times we get something on lockdown. We believe in God for something, but we see no evidence that it's going to happen. We see no evidence that God is moving in our life. And I know you have to sit there and act spiritual and act like you've always got it together. But I believe if we would be honest, we would all say, Pastor, there's been times and seasons in my life when I saw no evidence that it was ever going to get any better. In fact, I believe you're sitting here tonight and there are things that you're fighting, things that you're facing, and you see no evidence that it's ever going to get any better. So many times we come to church and it's the things we don't talk about that's stripping our faith. It's the things we don't sing about that we dare not utter out of our mouth that are eating away in our joy and in our peace. I found out it ain't what they're saying, it's what they're not saying. I believe we've been anointed to preach to the thing you're afraid to talk about. I believe that the anointing is to preach to the thing that you're afraid to talk about. To the stuff that you dare not utter. To the battles that you go through and you go through privately. And you go through silently. Because it is the job of the enemy to try to put everything you believe God for on lockdown. Believe in God for that daughter but you see no evidence that it's ever going to turn around. Believe in God for that marriage but you see no evidence that it's ever going to get any better. Believe in God that your life is going to shift. But you say, Pastor, this year looks just like last year. And the year before, everything I've been looking for is on lockdown. And it's not just people that have been serving God. It's not just people that are in their middle ages. I talk to people that are 15 years old. From 15 to 22, I talk to people. And you know, I find out they're beginning to feel the same stress as grown-ups. There are teenagers, y'all, that their stress level is through the roof. I'm not just talking about somebody that's 46 years old and has two kids in a church and a ministry. I'm talking about kids that ain't even got a job. Got a stress level through the roof. You and I live in the most stressed out generation that there has ever been. People will go off on you at the drop of a hat. How many of y'all ever get on YouTube? I get on YouTube. And I get, if I get on YouTube, I get stuck on YouTube. I get stuck on stuff called Walmart freakouts. Don't look at it. <laughs> How many of y'all have seen that Walmart freakouts? And people in Walmart, we've all seen it. I mean, people get mad for nothing. I saw that, I, I've seen people get stuff thrown at them just for walking down the wrong aisle. It wasn't like this 20 years ago, y'all. You, you didn't have to worry about getting shot if you didn't pull out soon enough at the red light 20 years ago. But now everybody's stressed out. Yeah. And people ain't just stressed out in the world, people stressed out in the church. People are battling stuff in here, and the problem is in church, we're not talking about what's really going on. 
I've got, I've got a son, y'all, and what worries me is he don't talk. Sometimes he'll get me to come out of the room and he'll talk to his mom, but she's the only person he'll talk to. And by the time he gets to talking to her, he's already in trouble. I'm thinking if you'd have had that conversation with mama six months ago, we wouldn't have a situation. But he waits until it's already gone bad. How many of y'all ever had somebody like that in your life? And I found out with, with, with Jake, the problem is it's what he ain't saying that gets him in trouble. It's what he won't tell you. It's what he can't talk about. What I found out about church people is if you can keep on coming to church and keep on worshiping and keep on talking to people, they're going to be all right. But it's the people that don't know how to open up. It's the people that feel like they're fighting battles all by themselves. David said, when I kept silent, my bones waxed old. If you're going through a battle and you talk about it, you're going to make it. But when you go through that thing and the devil convinces you to lock your mouth and silence your voice, that, my friend, is when you're getting in trouble. I'm preaching to somebody right now. The Bible says that John the Baptist was a voice. When he defined himself, he defined himself as a voice. He had a sense of purpose on his life, Cody. If I were to ask you to define yourself, what would you say? You would ask somebody, who are you? And John the Baptist said, I'm a voice. That captivates me. Because John the Baptist realized that there was a purpose on his life. Help me, Holy Ghost. Because there are so many people in this generation that have no sense of purpose and no sense of destiny. I tell the devil I can't die. I can't die because God ain't done with me. And some of you that has been messing with me, you ought to go ahead and say, devil, I can't die because God ain't done with me. If you believe God ain't done with you, you ought to take a 10 second praise. He's preached for me. But he was preaching a revival in Castlewood, Virginia. 
As he was preaching this revival in Castlewood, Virginia, he laid hands on a blind woman and she got healed. And news spread throughout Castlewood, Russell County, Dickinson County, Tazewell County. Ryan was a young preacher, as I was. And he called his mentor, Norval Hayes. And Norval Hayes was a legend of faith, a legend of preachers back in that day. And he had raised up Ryan and spoke into Ryan's life. And Ryan picked up the phone. And Ryan said, uh, hey, Brother Norval, I had to tell you, I healed a blind lady tonight that was legally blind, verified blind. I healed her. And instead of Norval acting like today's preachers, he said, that's great, Ryan. I hope you still love me. I'm so proud of you. You're the best. Norval said, you do realize God could have used an ass to heal that lady. <laughs> I think you know what they Suicide, and God spoke through you to me tonight and gave me hope. And I just repented in the presence of God. I said, God, forgive me. People need a voice. You can't tell what people's going through by how they look in here. Uh huh. Because there's been times I've been preaching to people in here. Let me show you what I got. If I was going by faces, I'd say, I'm missing. And those same people would come to me after service and say, Preacher, I couldn't let nobody know that everything you were saying is what I needed to hear. That's why God told Jeremiah to fear not the faces. Because if you get to pay attention to the faces, you will cease to be the voice they need you to be to hear from God. And John the Baptist was the voice. He said, I got a purpose. And my purpose is to prepare the way not just for my cousin, but for the Messiah, Jesus. And he would preach like nobody would preach. In fact, Jesus said he's the best there ever was under the old covenant. Jesus said, 
Jesus said it in He said, ain't nobody better than my cousin John. He's the best preacher the old covenant's ever had. He said, John is the real deal. When Jesus says you're good, you're good. Amen? Right. John the Baptist had this sense of purpose that I don't see a lot of believers today. That I don't see a lot of teenagers today. When we come up in church, we had a, a sense of purpose that we had to be there because God was going to use us to touch somebody. God was going to use us to be a voice in somebody's life. Let me ask you, are you a voice in anybody's life? Is there anybody that your words give them hope? That God uses you as a voice to talk them off the ledge. I'm a public voice that preaches to a lot of people every week. But God took her soft voice that keeps me going. Everybody needs a voice. Amen. Are you a voice? Are you speaking to people? When people hear you, do they hear a voice of hope? A voice that challenges them. A voice that encourages them. There are too many preachers in today's hour that are not voices from the Lord, but they're echoes from the past. And people are hungry for a fresh word from God. For something that's talking to what they're dealing with right now. And when you put yourself in the presence of God and say, God, make me a voice. Use me to be a vessel that you speak through into that person's life. I wouldn't be here today if it hadn't been for the voices that God sent into my life. I, I'm going to tell you, I hear voices. I still hear Bishop Jack talking to me. I still hear Kim Wilson preaching to me. I still hear Uncle Charlie. Even though, you know, he goes somewhere else, I still hear my Uncle Charlie in some of those early sermons that he preached. I hear those voices because those voices will forever go with me. And when God uses somebody to speak into your life, you never forget what it was they said. You, my friend, have been called to be a voice. There's somebody that's listening for you. Not to say, how you feeling today? But to say, what thus saith the Lord? There are too many times we speak out of our flesh rather than out of our spirit. Amen. Because when we all get mad, we all get cranky, we all get tired, and sometimes we'll say something in a moment of flesh that goes with them. When it was a prime opportunity for us to get out of our flesh and say, God, I know I want to cuss them out right now, but make me be a voice that says something you want me to say. Have you ever had a situation where you got ready to give somebody a piece of your mind? And then you realize you didn't have much left and you better keep it. That's what happens to me. There was this one time I was going to lie somebody else said, I was going to give them my last piece of mind. <laughs> and all of a sudden I felt challenged by the, by the Lord instead of just lining them out to begin to speak the word of God to them. My flesh wanted to smack them and wanted to line them out, but I let my spirit do the talking. And I'm going to say something to them. And when I said it, it not only changed their countenance in the situation, but it began to follow them the rest of their life. See, the enemy wants to wound you in the flesh so you don't speak out the spirit. Man, I'm preaching by the Holy Ghost right now. Let me say that again. The enemy wants to wound your flesh so that you don't speak out of the realm of the spirit. See, if he can get your feelings hurt and get you mad and get you angry, then you'll speak out of the flesh and hurt others rather than depositing a word from the spirit that will set the captive free. That's why the enemy always tries to wound your flesh so that you don't let your spirit do the talking. But I'm going to tell you, when you say, I'm going to be a voice for the Lord, you're going to have to realize there's going to be some times you don't feel like it. Speak anyhow. You don't feel like blessing them. Bless them anyhow. Because God has called you to be a voice. Lord, I'm feeling this right now. God has called you. Somebody can say, me. me. All right, this week, say, me. me. God has called you to be a voice. There are people around you just listening to your voice. Sometimes we get caught up in silly chatter when somebody's hoping that you use your voice to give them a fresh revelation of God, a fresh view of God. There are so many people today that are just saying, will anybody talk about the Lord? Will anybody give me something that can help me fight the battle that I'm facing at home? Because they can't always tell you what you're going, they're going through. But they're listening to anything you say that will give them hope. And nobody was a better voice than John the Baptist. Not Elijah, 
not Moses, not Joshua, not Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not Jonah when he came out of the belly of that whale, not Samson when he wore the Philistines out. Nobody can do it like John the Baptist. What does the Bible say Herod did? The Bible said he shut up John in prison. Feel on this? The enemy ain't got to kill you, man. He can just shut you up. He ain't got to kill you, Kevin. He can just shut you up. It becomes a job of the enemy to hurt you so bad that you quit being the voice God called you to be. That you quit speaking with the passion that you used to speak with. Have you ever met people at one season in their life they spoke with such passion, such anointing, and such zeal, but they went through some stuff, the promise got a lockdown, and now they've been shut up. Amen. Still coming to church, but they ain't saying nothing. Amen. Still believing in Jesus, but they ain't saying nothing. Because it is the job of the enemy to shut you up. He wanted to get Job to quit giving God the praise, so he released an onslaught trying to shut him up of where you're at right now. Because what has the enemy used? To try to shut you up. To try to get you to just go through the motions. John was so good at what it is, and you've got to realize when you're good at what you do, opposition will come against you. Nobody tackled the guy on the bench in the Patriots game. They probably wanted to, but they didn't. Why? They only tackled the guy with the ball. Why? Because the guy with the ball is holding what matters. The reason the enemy's been trying to tackle you is because you hold what matters. So if he's been trying to knock you out, you ought to give God a praise because you're packing something that he don't want you to bring across the goal line. Unless they're drunk, they're going to end up on YouTube. <laughs> but they try to tackle the quarterback because he got the ball. And that ball means advancement. When God puts something in you that can advance you and advance your family, then they try to tackle. I remember watching Ricky and Scotty play when I was a little boy that played basketball. I still believe the old man can take you. I don't care what you say. I watched them play basketball when they had the ball. One time I was playing Taz, man, I was just like a weird Taz. It was a good game, Rick. Good game. <laughs> Y'all beat the test. It was a good game, though. But I remember when they get that ball, man, you knew the Michaels boys was going to take the shot because y'all ain't real good at passing. <laughs> <laughs> and when you get the ball, whether it's basketball or football, all the emphasis comes on you. When you get the presence of God, and God drops a purpose in you. He drops a, a blessing on you. Spiritual opposition comes against you. To try to shut you up. To try to shut you down. To try to tackle you behind enemy lines. That even if he can't kill you, you're so hurt, you ain't giving God the praise. That you're so mad you ain't talking about God. That your kids are so jacked up that you don't want to talk about Jesus to nobody. Because your kids are trying to just preach them hypothetically. <laughs> but there's so much hell going on you can't talk about that you just shut up. And then if you shut up, Devil got you. Don't matter that you're still on the planet. If you're not occupying your purpose, you're not doing what God called you to do. And you'll go to heaven when you die in the sweet by and by, but you will not experience any victory now if you let the enemy shut you up and make you believe God's done with you. <coughs> John the Baptist, when he was shut up in that jail, he began to remember what Jesus spoke to him at the Jordan. He, he began to remember baptizing Jesus, the heavens opening up. The Spirit of God descending like a dove and God saying, this is my beloved Son and I'm not well pleased. It's like God was saying, John, you're right. And everything you did mattered. And I'm showing you in front of everybody that I got you and what you did mattered. We've all had those times where it's like God just publicly. I know when Kelly, Pastor Bobby, and Stan and Carly, we were in uh, Virginia up there. I was say Fredericksburg, Virginia. A lot of hundreds and hundreds of people. And God called me up. Um, a man called me up and spoke to me the word of the Lord about city on the hill without even knowing anything about it. And I said, finally, I've been confirmed. Yes, hallelujah. I knew the heavens opened up. I knew God told me to start this church. But can I tell you those moments after that? 
For I wasn't in the Jordan filled with the presence of God, but I was in the jailhouse filled with the light, filled with the emptiness. See, John the Baptist, if you would have asked him, is there any way you're wrong when he was standing in the Jordan? He said, I'm not wrong. I know God's with you. Each and every one of you, there's been times in your life where you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God was with you. Way back if you've ever been there. That you had enough faith to storm hell with the water pistol because you knew the heavens had opened up and God had put his hand on you. But this ain't where we find John the Baptist. Because just as surely as there's a Jordan experience in this thing, there's a jailhouse experience in this thing. And in that jailhouse, ain't no heavens opening up. Ain't no spirit of God descending like a dove. And to beat it all, Jesus wouldn't even come a visit. It didn't happen the first 30 minutes. It didn't happen the first hour. It didn't happen the first day. But somewhere as the days went on, John the Baptist saw no evidence that God was with him in here. And Jesus wasn't coming to see him. And his body was growing weak. And he was on lockdown because he preached a powerful gospel. You've got to hear me now. Sometimes it's because of what you're doing right that makes things go a little bit wrong. Amen. John the Baptist could have handled it if he would have done something wrong and they would have put him in there. But it really checks your faith when you've done right for people and they do you wrong. Right. When you're trying to help them and they hurt you, who am I talking to? Amen. When you've done good to them and they do evil to you. John is in the jailhouse, and the jailhouse says, you were wrong, John. Where's Jesus now? Where's that spirit descending like a dove now? Where's that voice now? You ain't heard nothing in so long. All you see is bars. All you see is emptiness. Your faith is on lockdown. John, you were wrong. God ain't with you. You, you got to hear me right now because that's the same place some of you are. I feel this so strong that I can't even articulate it. Some of you are in that jailhouse. For the enemy's whispering to you, if God's really going to bail your kid out, why are you here? Why ain't they acting right? If it, God really spoke to you that it's going to be okay, why does it seem worse today than it did back then? If God really said he's going to turn it around, then where's the evidence he's going to turn it around? The enemy is a master of coming to the jail cell and trying to talk you out of your conscience. Notice that the devil didn't mess with John the Baptist when he was sitting in the middle of Jordan. But in that prison cell, Satan began to whisper to him. You really think you're going to make it? You've invested all your time and all your ministry on this guy Jesus, your cousin, and he won't even come and see you. And something crept into John, it's crept into you, and it's crept into me. We don't talk about it, we don't shout about it, but it's real. A little thing called doubt. Mm, we love to talk about faith because we talk, talk and keep walking about the fact of devil's back of folks. But the truth is, it's the doubt. And sometimes we don't feel like we can do with that. Amen. Amen. John the Baptist finds himself saying, oh, Lord, I'm doubting. I'm doubting my cousin. I'm doubting my Lord. I'm doubting my life. I'm doubting that I spent all those years doing the right thing. Now, before we get too hard on John the Baptist, let's be real. We've all been there where we begin to doubt. It can get so tough. Now, maybe you ain't had that, so I want you to pray for me at the end of service, anointed chair. Because you must be Jesus' second cousin. So I need you to pray for me. But we've all had them times in life when we begin to doubt. We say, God, is it going to be okay? Amen. Did I really hear you? Amen. Did you really move for me? Or God was it a figment of my imagination? Did I make it up? Have you left me, God? Or were you ever even really there? Because the jailhouse can challenge. The jailhouse makes you think it ain't going to be okay. The jailhouse makes you think it was all an illusion and it's going downhill from here. And John got so bad off that he did the unthinkable. He sent two of his disciples to ask Jesus if he was who he said he was. Two's the number of witnesses. Two's the number of affirmation. These two witnesses go to Jesus and they said, Jesus, this is an embarrassing question. But uh, your cousin, John, he ain't been to see him. And he's struggling. And he's struggling so bad that he's, he's, he's wondering if you're really the one. Or maybe he missed it. And he should be preaching for somebody else. Because every covenant relationship will be tested. Amen. And what blesses me about Jesus is he didn't 
flip out on John and disown him the way church people do today. Jesus can handle our doubt. Jesus doesn't get nervous when we go through doubts. We do, but he don't. Because he knows he's going to bring us through the doubt and get us back under the spout where the glory is pouring out and we're going to want to scream and shout. He knows we're going to be okay. Uh -huh. The doubt's your problem. It ain't his problem because he's the author and the finisher and he's going to make sure your faith is okay. Jesus didn't say, well, you tell John I'll banish him to eternal darkness. I'm done with him for doubting me. No, that's what Pentecostal preachers do, but that ain't what Jesus did. Jesus said, you go tell my cousin it's all right. You go tell him the deaf they hear, the blind they see, the lepers there cleanse and the dead that raised. My cousin John, he's going to be all right because I'll take care of him my way. <coughs> he said, you go tell him. John will get all he needs when he knows that. You tell him. And Jesus waited till his disciples walked off so they couldn't hear him. Because that's just the way Jesus is. And he started bragging on John. And he said, by the way, I know John's doubting right now. He's struggling. To all y'all that's listening, you heard them ask him. But there ain't nobody better than John the Baptist. Under the old covenant, ain't nobody ever preached it better than John the Baptist. He said, I'm proud that he's my cousin. I'm proud that he's my servant. And he is the greatest in the old covenant. He said, but I'm getting ready to do something so marvelous that even though John was greatest of the old, he shall be least in the new covenant because I'm getting ready to do something that my cousin John never saw. And in John's spirit, he knew that. That's why John the Baptist said, I must decrease that he might increase. And can I tell you, here's when you're walking with God, when you say, God, don't let them see me, but let them see you. God begin to do something in John the Baptist says, I don't care if they know my name. I just want them to know Jesus. That's what made him a voice. And when you begin to pray, God, make me a voice that makes your name great. I know a lot of people want to get into the ministry. A lot of people want to preach. <clears throat> I, I did a Facebook Live this morning. Did anybody see that? It was like the 7th morning. <laughs> After I did the Facebook Live, <coughs> I had a preacher text me and said that he'd been bitter at me for years. And he was bitter because I, I didn't let him preach. And he was bitter because he wanted to make his name great. And I sense that, and y'all don't know who I'm talking about because I don't throw people on the bus. But the reason I didn't give him the pulpit was, first of all, God didn't tell him to. And second of all, he was preaching condemnation on people. And thirdly, he was doing it to make his name known and not the name of Jesus' name. Amen. And you can't release that on your people because it'll mess your people up. And well, that I didn't love the guy, it's just I felt restrained to not release him on y'all. So y'all are welcome. But I didn't. <laughs> But he's still mad about it. He's still bitter. And a lot of people are bitter because they want to be a voice to lift their name up. But when God begins to work on you, you get to a place where you say, God, it ain't about me. It's about you. And there are people that need to hear from you. So God, if you just anoint me, I don't care if they know my name, if they remember me, but God, if you would just speak to me, to that person, so that they don't commit suicide, so that they don't go the wrong way, God, I'll give you all the praise in there. God is raising up some people that are praying to be a voice. And John the Baptist, he was taken out, he was, he was removed because his purpose had been fulfilled. It is not the will of God for any of you to be removed from this planet until your purpose has been fulfilled. That jailhouse almost talked John out of believing that he had done the right thing. Can I tell you, after I knew that I knew, and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have took nothing for believing that God told me to start sitting on the hill. There were times that in the jailhouse of life, because I found out a jailhouse ain't always got to have metal bars. Sometimes your jailhouse can be your marriage. Sometimes your jailhouse can be in your mind. Sometimes your jailhouse can be the relationships around you that try to put you on lockdown. 
and tell you you'll never be nothing. You'll never be nothing. Some of you in the jailhouse you're fighting is the memories of your past. That every time you want to go forward, the bars of your past go up and say, who do you think you are, son? Who do you think you are, girl? Can you stay in that invisible jailhouse? Because the toughest prisons are invisible. Because they're not out here. They're in here. And I know that I know that I know that in God you're going to have Jordan experiences where you say, ooh, I heard God tonight. But I know that when God truly makes your voice and puts his hand on it, there's, there's going to be experiences. There's going to be times that you're going to say, oh God, I'm in a jailhouse. Where are you, Lord? I haven't felt you in so long. Why won't you come and visit me? God, I see this person getting blessed. I see that person getting blessed. Their family's going better, but I feel like I've been shut up in prison. And I've allowed my boys to be silent. Paul and Silas in the midnight hour, and I know you guys know the scriptures, so I know. But in the midnight hour, the devil thought he had Paul and Silas because they were in prison, in the toughest part of the prison. And it was midnight. And the devil said, I'll just use the same trick on them I did on John the Baptist. I put them in prison. Shut them up. But the devil made a mistake. He put them in prison together. Amen. And the devil forgot that one could chase a thousand, but two could put 10,000 to flight. And at the darkest time of their life, they joined hands. And they said, we might be on lockdown, but we will not be shut up. And they began to praise God from the jailhouse and praise God from the prison. And then a whole lot of shaking went on. And God said, everybody free. I dare you to praise God. And as she sings, 
As Cody sings, verse, and as Cody and Pam sing, I just want y'all to praise the Lord. Don't be silent. 